that should be okay so yes perfect so welcome to the one of the last talks this year for computational genetic discussion group and today we have Breno Pragomeni speaking he's an assistant professor in animal genomics at the University of Connecticut in the US he's originally from Brazil he finished his master's degree there after that, Breno went to University of Georgia to study with Ignacy Michel, where, where he got his PhD, and that's where Breno and me meet each other. And uh, Breno was kind of helping me when I started uh, at the Georgia. Breno was also postdoc there for three years. And uh, his research focuses on genomic evaluations of complex traits, more specifically, heat stress, disease resistance, and behavior. Uh, he also works with theoretical implications of different priors and selected markers for our prediction models. And at this moment, he is doing research uh, about how to implement genomic selection in dairy and beef cattle, shrimp breeding, and dog breeding. So, Breno, whenever you want to start, floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you very much for introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me for this talk. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to such a prestigious group, and I'll try to share uh, uh, one of the topics that I started actually still back in Georgia, reading about it, and basically we just um, never stop learning about that, and, and what I've been doing recently is that I'm finding implications of that inclusion of causative variants in prediction models. Things that we learned of that first project that we ever made, uh, um, they relate to several other findings that we're having in the most diverse things. So I'll, I'll try to, 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 to tell a little bit of that story and show some of the results we got and try to discuss a little bit of the literature. Um, I'm not sure how uh, 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 basic my introduction is going to be, but I'll try to, to be brief with that. You guys probably know better than I do. Uh, what is our goal as animal breeders? Uh, we try to tell which animal has the best genetics so that we can improve domestic species. For complex traits, what usually happens is that we have a bunch of genes interacting with the environment and with themselves and with some other things that we don't fully understand. Um, but still, our goal is to try to, to identify individuals with what we understand as superior genetics so that we can have better phenotypes uh, uh, and, and, and get what we, we, we need to improve uh, uh, um, our, our industry, I usually think about food industry, but more recently I've been working with other industries, such as canine, uh, um, everything is about the same. So we try to get, in the end of the day, we got to tell whoever is doing the reproduction decisions, who is the best candidate. And how do we do that? Well, we got to come up with lots of statistics, lots of numbers, lots of math uh, um, to try to solve a very complex problem. Uh, the main problem is that we cannot simply measure genetics when you're talking about complex traits. Um, we, we have to think about the individual as a whole, and uh, uh, we know that individuals are different, and if they are different from each other because of the genetics, we try to identify what is the genetic component that makes those individuals better than than each other. Uh, uh, again, the the um, the prediction that we're trying to make is is using our data and our observations to try to guess or predict some values that are actually not measured and not included in the data. Um, and that put us in a very special circumstance in our field that is, you're just not trying to compare treatments, diets, farms, and some other things. We're trying to, to, to calculate something that we are not even, even sure that it exists, uh, uh, but we have a theory for that. And our theory 
is that we have a huge number of genes with a very teeny tiny effect, uh, uh, each one of them. They have a very small contribution to the phenotypes. Uh, and that allow us to, to follow Mendel laws and follow the distributions of data that we usually can observe. Um, we did that for a long, long time, and we, we kind of still do that somehow. The problem is this type of approach uh, uh, for the infinitesimal model, it's what some people call back a black box approach which it works all right for, for, for prediction. Uh, it's feasible, statistically speaking, but biologically, some of those assumptions are not very sound for some people. So what people did, they tried to understand what was going on, why individual A was better than individual B. Why is this dairy bull the best bull in the country? Uh, they were not happy with the answer that, well, this bull is better because the daughters are better. Therefore, we should keep using it. Um, and they tried to come up with different types of, of, uh, um, of markers. Some of those markers were uh, metabolic markers, enzymes. They would measure whatever they could, try to associate with uh, phenotypes. They did some simple genetic markers. Uh, uh, and, and even more advanced QTL mapping and linkage mapping. And the idea was very, very simple. They would measure those markers and they would see which individual was carrying a specific type of markers, what were their phenotypes, and then they would just select on the markers that were associated with the best phenotypes. And then they would have the best individuals. If we find the markers that are causing individuals to be better, we can just look at the markers instead of doing all this complicated statistics and progeny testing and some other things, and we'll do something great. Um, I actually, when I was, it, before I went to grad school, I had this great idea uh, uh, that we could use markers for that. And then I started reading about it and I realized that it was not my idea. Uh, the oldest that I could found about it was from 1991. Uh, that was one of the coolest ideas that uh, they would identify embryos with the markers uh, um, that were associated with the best phenotype. And then they would already call the animals on the embryo level. And they could even, instead of uh, uh, letting this embryo grow, they could differentiate this embryo into, uh, 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 into gametes and doing the reproduction in vitro for a long, long time, getting several generations in the lab and doing lots of improvements. Um, it didn't work the way they intended to. I don't even know if they actually did it, but the idea is pretty cool. Um, another example is that they identified one marker that they called the gene star in 2000. And this marker was associated with higher meat quality in beef cattle. By 2004, they identified six more markers. By 2006, they identified four more markers. After that, they identified 56 markers with uh, uh, meat quality. Um, and what they found is that the, the, this, those 56-ish markers were not significantly associated with meat quality in some populations. So even though the idea was simple, it didn't agree with what people were saying, were seeing in real life. And in real life, actually, just using the pedigrees and going back to that black box approach that we have an infinite number of genes with very small effect each, was working much better for breeding purposes than some of those markers, especially in animals. Um, the two main reasons for that is, with the technology at the time that was available, we just didn't have enough markers. We have way too many genes to track and those markers are not marking everything that we needed. And the second thing is even then, even though we could identify some of the markers close enough to some of those genes that are important, uh, selection for those markers would decay that LD between whatever marker we had and the gene 
So selecting for the marker would end up becoming almost a random selection after a while. However, uh, in, in the animal breeding context in 2001, uh, uh, this, this new paper came um, and, and every time I present that slide, there is somebody that will point to people uh, um, coming up with similar ideas before this paper, but I think for animal breeding, that's our benchmark, uh, um, that they basically use a very dense marker panel to calculate breeding values. And in this case, it was much more accurate in pedigree. Um, and there was no need to understand why that uh, 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 panel of markers biologically would select ideal animals. But we could, because we have markers all over the genome, we can calculate the marker effect, and then we can try to understand what is close to those markers. So that was a big step in our field. And, and we can simplify that as a single SNP regression. That's when we'll come up with a prediction equation that will have the effects of each one of the SNPs. And we do that for all of the SNPs. And we try to calculate either the phenotype or the genetic merit of this animal based on the uh, uh, counting of the alleles that we have. If we do that for all the SNPs, we're using a whole genome approach that can calculate breeding values. Um, and we could actually look for that function. And in real life, we learned that accuracy was a function of two things. Uh, one is that how many animals we could have, have in, our, in our analysis. And two, how many SNPs we could in, in, increase. The more SNPs, the higher the accuracy. The more animals, the higher the accuracy, up to a point. Uh, we got to a point that adding data, it, it could be adding more SNPs or adding more animals would stop uh, uh, increasing the accuracy. And on the SNPs, it makes sense because, well, uh, uh, SNPs are in, in linkage equilibrium with something. So after a while, we have so many SNPs that they will be in LD with pretty much everything that we want to learn. So adding more SNPs would not help. Uh, we got the rule of thumb that 50,000 SNPs is good for every species. It will be less for some, a little bit more for others. Um, but increasing SNPs for much more than 50,000 does not seem to help the accuracy very much it could actually come up with a new problem. That is, the more SNPs we add, the higher the correlation between SNPs will be. Uh, and I did this exercise here with my students once, um, just creating a very, very simple scenario that I had uh, two variables, B and C. And in my simulation, variable B was causing variable C. And I did a very simple regression and I got an R score of 0.97. Uh, and the effect of B was very similar from what I simulated, that it was five units. Um, and, and, and that was that was what I simulated. So it's a very, very simple simulation. I think I did 4,000 animals. No, I did 100 animals. To be honest, I don't remember how many animals I have here. Anyways, I forgot how R shows it. Um, yeah, I think I have 100 animals here. Anyways, uh, what, I'm, what, what I was trying to learn here was that what happens if I increase the number of markers without increasing the number of animals and without increasing the number of causative variants that affect my simulated treat. Uh, we all learn in, 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 in when you're learning linear models that a high correlation between the parameters inflates the variance of the estimator. We call that multicollinearity. Uh, that's a quite important topic that we tend to ignore. So what I did in the simulation here, I created 
uh, markers all the way to K. And none of those markers were causing my uh, variable C anymore, except from B. Um, what happened when I included a lot of markers that were highly correlated, so they were, they were in LD to each other, was that my R squared went basically to one. That's a perfect R squared. So my prediction actually increased a little bit, which is very good. But look what happened with the effect of B. B was simulated to have an effect of five units on my phenotype. And now my B has a negative 0 0.5 units and it still shows as significant in my, uh, uh, in my regression here. So biologically, the interpretation of a negative value of B is completely uh, uh, wrong in some case, uh, uh, in, in this case. Um, and, and that's a quite dangerous assumption. Um, in genomic selection, we know that single SNP regression has several pitfalls. So we do some changes to that because we know that SNPs are in, 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 in LD with each other. So we try to avoid uh, uh, those problems of multicollinearity. Uh, we include all these SNPs off at the same time. However, we know we cannot do that. So what do we do? We assume a prior distribution from these SNPs, which could be uh, uh, all the markers have the same variance or we can add more complex uh, uh, models with some pretty fancy uh, um, Bayesian priors and, and, and then we can run those regressions. Or we can just calculate relationship matrix using the SNPs and then calculate the breeding values using a model that's very, very similar from what we did before. Um, depending on your prior, uh, the SNP effect model or the relationship matrix model, they're equivalent. So in the end of the day, they will provide very similar results, if not the same. Um, and, and we can actually add priors and assign weights and prioritize SNPs for calculating the, the, the relationship matrices. So we can actually... Um, we can actually accommodate any type of, of belief that we have for our trait and do a very good uh, uh, job on predicting animals. So what is the idea here? Well, if we have the causative variance, our accuracy should be very high. How high should it be? Well, if I have all the causative variance, it should be one. Uh, some of the details that we have in real life they will make it slightly less than one, but it shouldn't be much lower than one. So what I did here in this first paper, that was a simulation that we simulated two traits, one trait with 100 QTLs and a trait with 1,000 QTLs. And we used several different approaches uh, to try to calculate breeding values, including, so in blue, we have the 100 QTNs and in orange, you have the 1,000 QTNs. Here on the left-hand side, we have all including the QTNs. And the accuracy was, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry. On the left-hand side, we have including the dense panel plus the QTNs. And the accuracy didn't start as, as great as we expected. If we started considering that different SNPs, different markers have a uh, different variance, so we allow some markers to, to become more important than others, the accuracy increased a little bit. When I use the true effect of each one of the models, we started approaching the value of one. And then I did a little bit of fine tuning and we got uh, uh, finally the values very, very close to one. Uh, um, so pretty much anybody using causative variance, they should get uh, uh, very high accuracies, right? Uh, more recently, I'm working with a grad student and what she's doing, she is uh, working with three traits now. So we learned from, what we learned from this, this research here was that 
we can get accuracies very close to one if we have the causative variance, but they depend on several details on how we, we run our analysis. For example, using the simulated uh, breeding, uh, the simulated SNP effects, which is not very realistic, and accounting for the limited dimensionality of the genomic information, um, which that is very feasible. Um, from, from, from that uh, work, we learn a lot. So this paper here is from 2017. Um, we learned a lot from that simulation and looking at things at the literature. So one thing that we learned is that 100 QTN was too few to be considered something realistic. So we came up with another scenario of 2,000 QTLs. Um, the other thing that we did was if we only have the simulated QTLs in the analysis, uh, our accuracy eventually is going to go to one. So what we're trying to do here is, uh, um, and that's not realistic. Um, so what we're trying to do here is that we include the causative variance in the chip, or we just use the chip without the causative variance. Um, and then use different methods. Uh, uh, we kept the heritability the same, and we basically use three GBLOP approaches. And the main difference here on the GBLOP is that our pseudo phenotype that I call here pseudo EBV, uh, uh, the pseudo phenotype for the genotype the animals in my GBLOP could be just the phenotype, which is the worst case scenario. It could be the phenotype, the, the true breeding value with a small normal added to it. Or it just could be, be the true brain value, which is the best case scenario. So GBLOP1 is really bad. GBLOP2 GBLOP is intermediate. GBLOP3 is uh, uh, the best one. And we also tested a single step GBLOP. Uh, and I'm going to explain why we did that in a second. Uh, what I call GBLOP here was basically a model with a genomic relationship matrix that only include the genotype animals. Um, the other thing that we did here is that we use quadratic weights or nonlinear A weights for calculating those relationships. The quadratic weights, we estimated the SNP effect and we squared them. Um, we also tried that value multiplied by 2PQ, but the results were not as good, so we just used the, the squared of the estimated SNP effect. And we used a nonlinear A which limits the maximum variances uh, uh, and the changes in the SNP effects. Um, that can actually vary quite a lot. So, so we test different parameters. So the parameters allow how much it's going to vary and what's going to be the maximum change. On the right-hand side here, on the right-hand side here, we see what happens. In orange, we have uh, uh, the quadratic weights which are called linear here, uh, uh, because that was what we call it at the time. And we see that if the SNP effects get above one, the effect of those SNPs, they, they grow extremely fast. And if the SNP effect is below one, the, 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 the variance of that SNP shrinks towards zero very fast. While the nonlinear A, which is the blue line here, caps the value at a minimum and at a maximum which uh, um, gets some intermediate uh, 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 allowance on how much those SNPs will vary, but will not allow some SNPs to take over all of the, uh, uh, the effects while some others are gonna be ignored. On the left-hand side here, we have a very simple simulation showing that the models will converge at a very high accuracy, um, but the linear models, they tend not to converge at the maximum accuracy. Um, that was a, a simpler simulation just to illustrate how those weights would, uh, uh, would work. We had the fast base A also in this simulation here, but the fast base A did not work for more complex scenarios. So we, we decided not to use it. Now, going back, to the results of that paper that my student is writing right now, what we have here is the triangles would include the causative variance 
and the circles are going to include only the SNPs. On the left hand side, you have 100 QTN. On the middle one, you have 1,000 QTN. And with 2,000, on the right hand side, you have 2,000 QTNs. What happens is that using quadratic weights, if we have just a few QTNs, you're going to find them all. And you're going to shrink everybody back towards zero. Therefore, our accuracy is going to converge at one. With 1,000 QTNs, what's going to happen? is that some of those uh, uh, QTNs that have a smaller effect, they're going to shrink towards zero and you're going to lose some accuracy. And with 2,000 QTNs, it's very similar from 1,000 and the accuracy drops a teeny tiny bit more. Um, so it seems to be a good approach when we have the inclusion of the causative variance in the chip. Um, however, when we remove that, and that is always for the GBLOP3, which uses a true breeding value. When we change our pseudo phenotype for not so good ones, what is going to happen is that our accuracy does not converge at the maximum anymore. Um, even if we have the causative variance. And what makes it even worse is that when we uh, remove the causative variance from the chip, our accuracy actually converges at lower values than the maximum and much lower values than everything. So we always see the trend that GBLOP1, which is the GBLOP with the worst um, pseudo phenotype will have the worst accuracies and that's gonna increase. So that's for the 100 QTN scenario, right? As we add more QTNs, the quadratic weights tend to become worse and worse and worse. And in real life, what we have it's probably something much closer to the right-hand side for complex traits. So we do not have the causative variance included in this scenario. And um, our pseudo phenotype is usually not a true green value, which is gonna make adding weights to our genomic relationship matrix a really bad decision. It's gonna drop the accuracy. When you use the nonlinear A weights on the perfect case scenario, the results are much better. Um, and on the other scenarios, the inclusion of the causative variance, we get much higher accuracies. Why is that? We are not allowing the SNPs to drop uh, uh, to zero anymore. And then we are accounting for all the causative variance. Uh, it's still far, far away from the ideal scenario. And the, the true breeding value here as a pseudo phenotype would still converge at a very high accuracy. But what we want to check in here is that when you look at the bottom accuracies, that is the more realistic scenario, controlling the maximum weight that we give to a SNP and avoiding shrinking SNPs towards zero, that would provide, if not increasing accuracy, at least stable accuracies across the weights. Uh, in the end of the day, using weights for complex traits doesn't seem to be a very good idea. Uh, unless we have a, a simpler genetic architecture, which doesn't make that trait as complex, or if we have uh, uh, the inclusion of the causative variance in the, um, in the scenario, um, which again, I don't know how realistic it is. This result is not only found by us, several other authors found that. Uh, uh, that is one of the nicest papers that agree with what I'm saying here. In red here, they have their GBLOP, and in green and purple, they have the base B and base C. And what they did, they increased the number of individuals from 75 to 80 to 8,000 animals. Well, when we have no data, both uh, models are equally bad. When they have tons of data, both methods are equally good. When they have intermediate uh, uh, number of animals, the prior uh, uh, was very important. So the prior didn't help when it didn't have data, and the prior didn't help much when it had tons of data. But when data was uh, uh, scarce, then the prior works. Um, that going back to what we found here, that agrees what we, with what we found. So the true green value here as the pseudo phenotype 
that's that will be the scenario and have tons of data. So it, it doesn't really matter the method so much. But when you have fewer data, uh, um, the weights would uh, um, help a lot, especially um, uh, 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 on the intermediate scenarios, that would be the GBLOP2 and the single step GBLOP. And especially when we didn't have a lot of markers. So take into consideration all of that. There was a time and people are still trying to do it, maybe not as much as before, but they're still trying to do it. They would get uh, uh, either whole sequence data or RNA-seq, they would find variants they would get those variants that for some people are causative, they would fit in the prediction model, and then they'll get accuracies of one, just like we did in the simulation. However, in real life, some of the results found either no improvement or very little improvement. And there are many more references with much better results than that. Uh, um, one thing that happened is, there were some papers that have found an absurd increment of accuracy. And why was that? Some of those researchers, they were using the same population for testing and finding the causative variants, which led to a very high accuracy within the sample. But when they tried to prove those causative variants in other populations, they couldn't confirm them. Uh, uh, which is a classic case of double dipping, which is not a good idea for trying to find uh, um, those causative variants. So what we did, we went back to our colleagues from USDA uh, um, and we got their data and we got the 17,000 causative variants that Van Raden and, and collaborators found in 2017. We used 4 million records for stature, stature so we cannot say that the problem here was that we didn't have lots of data. Heritability was pretty high. And we had 27,000 genotype sires. That was probably more than enough from what we needed. And then we did two things. We did the regular SNP chip with 54,000 SNPs. And we had the chip with the 17,000 causative variants uh, um, uh, um, they were identified by Van Raden. Um, so our initial thought, so th those are the first results. So we did the GBLOP with heterogeneous residual variants. We did a single step GBLOP and it did a single step GBLOP with uh, indirect prediction. So we didn't have the family structure here affecting. And we found that a single step GBLOP was better than everything. And that was our method. So we were happy with that. We wanted to show everybody that single step was the best method out there. Um, what happened was that once we include the causative variants in our scenario, the GBLOP gains appeared a little bit, but the single step uh, uh, did not improve. So what we did, we started calculating weights for the GBLOP. So we thought that the problem was that we were not having weights. And the GBLOP kept improving and the single step did not improve. Actually, the weights uh, uh, harmed GBLOP, uh, harmed single step a little bit. And then by one accident, I fit a homogeneous residual variance GBLOP. Um, what happened when I did that, we found that the effects of weights were actually much higher than the effects of weights when I have the proper GBLOP. We still did not increase uh, uh, as much uh, uh, as the good GBLOP, but it got closer by using weights. Um, so on, on the single step GBLOP, the results were actually very close to the heterogeneous residual variance. So the nonlinear weights maintain the accuracy, the linear weights decrease the accuracy, uh, uh, and the no weights were the same as the nonlinear. On the bad GBLOP, adding weights increased the, 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 the variance. 
So why did that happen? Um, GBLOP only account for genotyped animals and we do not have phenotypes on the variables. Um, once we calculate the pseudo phenotypes for the single step GBLOP, we lose a little bit of information there. And then the prior starts to make sense. Uh, that is our prior here on the nonlinear one on the bad GBLOP that actually uh, uh, agrees with our previous results and the results from Karaman saying that if we have a, a really bad data, the prior helps a lot. If you have very good data, it doesn't help that much. Uh, with the single step, because you're using all the data, the prior, if we have enough data, it shouldn't matter that much. Those results were actually confirmed by inclusion of causative variants. The maximum gain that we had was on the worst model that was the homogeneous G block. The causative variants helped quite a lot. On, uh, um, on the G block, they helped a little bit, but on the single step G block, they didn't help uh, uh, much. Even the weights didn't help much. So again, the more data we have and the less dimensions we lose by calculating pseudo phenotypes, the less the prior or the weights would help. And another thing here is that those variants, they're not necessarily causative, which makes it much, much harder for us to, to see if they're just a dancer SNP chip or if, if we're actually adding something that is causing our traits. Even if they were causative. So going back to my uh, uh, student's paper, to Bruno's paper, GBLOP1, that was the bad pseudo phenotype. GBLOP3 is the very good pseudo phenotype. The proportion of gains by adding the causative variants, even without the weights, was much higher on the GBLOP1, that was between 23 and 30 percent, than the GBLOP3 in single step which capped at about 16 to 18 percent gains uh, in the best case scenario. In the worst case scenario, GBLOP just gained 6 percent uh, uh, on the very uh, 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 on the accuracy. And again, that is still unweighted. So there is much more that we are still investigating on that. Several reasons for that. One is that in real life, most of the causative variants are not causative. That's why in our paper with the Holstein Rio data, we call them selected variants. Um, the main problem is our theory seems to be wrong when we think that we are going to find all of those variants. Some authors said that we need more records. We need more data to find those variants. Um, well, that research from, from our colleagues from USDA, they had 20 million markers and more than 3 million records. Uh, as you guys probably saw even uh, uh, saying, 14,000 animals for the US host and population can explain about 100% of the, the, the genetic variability of the population. So uh, uh, 3 million genotyped animals seem to be pretty good for finding those variants. We're talking about very complex traits uh, like milk production, stature, extremely complex things. It's almost impossible to name a single gene or pathway that will have no effect on those, uh, um, on those traits. And the effect of those pathways are gonna be very, very, very small. So we have a lot, a huge number of genes with very small effect, and we get back to Fisher's model. Uh, we have more issues here. Sometimes we cannot sequence the exact causative variants. So in this simulation here, I tagged as the causative variant, the next SNP. So it was still in high LD. And what happened if we just miss the correct causative variant by a little bit, our accuracy drops quite fast. And if we miss them by about 12 SNPs, uh, uh, which was not a long distance, the LD here was still pretty high, uh, uh, our accuracy went back to uh, the polygenic model. In real life, are we tagging the causative mutation or something very close to the causative mutation? 
And on top of that, sometimes we find a very good uh, variant, but we cannot just genotype that very easily uh, uh, for several reasons that I don't fully understand. But uh, um, just by chance, some of those uh, variants that are identified, they have a very low call rate. So we've got to move with something in LD to that, and then we lose a little bit of that accuracy as well. The other thing is, if we have more SNPs than only the causative, our accuracy drops. So over here, what we have on the x-axis is how many SNPs we are removing neighboring the causative variants. So if we don't remove any of the SNPs, our accuracy starts from 0.9. And as we remove the SNPs and we keep only the causative variants, our accuracy approaches one. Uh, the more SNPs we have in our chip, the lower is the gain from the causative variants. So in real life, what happens is that it's very risky to remove the SNPs from a polygenic uh, uh, chip and just assume that we found everything. So adding those causative variants, it's going to be less helpful in a very dense chip, unless we can find the true effect of those causative variants, which is not something very likely. On top of everything, uh, 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 the way we're identifying some of those causative variants, we're just doing uh, uh, a simple GWAS, identifying the variants and putting them in a chip. And we all know that we are just doing the, the association between something in LD with a, a, a causative gene. And assuming that just a G was heat in a very dense analysis is causative, it's a very, very dangerous assumption, especially when you're talking about complex traits. When you're talking about gene expression, that, that goes back again to, to to what we are, we are thinking, that is uh, uh, gene expression patterns, they vary so much that if we take gene expression patterns in the same animals in different days, you're gonna find different variants as well. So taking those variants as causative, it's again, something that's very dangerous. So what I did here in this study, we had the same population and I just removed one generation from the population and I found different peaks in my GWAS. Uh, so again, using our theory for GWAS to find the causative variants to be included in the paper is a very dangerous assumption. On top of that, what are we actually estimating in our models? We are estimating chromosome segments. And I'm sure that even uh, 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 covered that several times with you guys, the number of, uh, um, of things that we're actually estimating that are the independent chromosome segments is very, very small when you have lots of markers for that, which goes back to the multicollinearity problem as before. So the breeding values are good, but the biological explanation of how we got those breeding values, there is a high predict on error variance for these SNP effects, therefore for our GWAS. On top of everything, we have our family structure. Uh, um, one experiment that we did, one, one test that we did uh, 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 a long time ago in Georgia was that we had this fish population and it had several families. And then what we did, we removed some of the families and our GWAS had less and less peaks. The accuracy did not decrease, but the GWAS was completely different. Uh, um, similar to that in this method, in this example here, we have two different methods finding two very different GWAS results. Uh, um, the, both of the methods, they have the same accuracy, but the GWAS again was very, very different. So the GWAS still varies a lot. So trusting those results and call things causative, that's very dangerous. Uh, in summary, when include causative variants, the gains are somewhat limited when the trait is very, very polygenic. If our trait is simpler, then the gains are better. Um, the gains were much better in GBLOP than single-step GBLOP. 
especially when our GBLOP was bad. So basically, when it didn't have lots of data in our GBLOP, the gains were the best. When it had a very good GBLOP, the gains were not very good, which means that the, the, the prior has a, a, a much more power when we don't have data, which is something that uh, 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 I learned a while ago in my uh, uh, first Bayesian class that I took, right? Uh, the way we weight these NIPs is very, very important. So our prior here is very, very important. If we let our SNPs with the higher fat take over, what's going to happen in real life is that you're going to lose accuracy. However, if we uh, uh, limit the gains from the SNPs, our gains in accuracy are going to be limited too. Uh, sequencing more animals or using more markers is not increasing our ability to find those uh, uh, those causative variants. So my idea here is we got to stop a little bit, take one step back and try to understand what's going on instead of trying to increase the number of animals in the analysis. Increasing numbers is not helping. So the, 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 in my opinion, the whole problem is our theory. And our theory is trying to, to go as far as we can from what Fisher is doing, uh, what Fisher proposed. But I still think that he's right. I think that in the end of the day, we have a huge number of genes with a very small effect each. So trying to identify those causative variants is going to end up in a very dense chip in the end. Uh, uh, so if we don't change our theory, we're not going to have very big gains in accuracy. So what are we trying to do to understand those things? Uh, um, my PhD student, Bruna Santana, she is testing different weights and methods in simulated data with and without causative variants. She's trying to find the best combination of method uh, uh, and inclusion to see what it can learn and what it can propose for real life uh, 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 implementations. She's also doing a two-trait analysis with, in which both traits are highly correlated. So she's doing that as separate traits. And she's trying to understand why the GWAS is so different. Even though the, the rank correlation of the best animals is the same, the genetic correlation is very high. The GWAS between those two traits is very different. Um, similar to that, but now working with dogs, uh, Molly Reiser, uh, she just turned a PhD student, so I apologize for the error here. She's doing GWAS and prediction is in sequence data in behavior traits in dogs. We have several traits. Uh, we have sequence data, and we're trying to understand what happens uh, uh, with the GWAS across those traits, especially when they're highly correlated. Can we identify and annotate different genes or not, and why? Um, Isabel is a PhD student. She's working on genomic selection for disease resistance in shrimp. Um, the, pr the problem she's trying to answer here is, can we pr prepare better phenotypes to overcome the limitation of small data? So the problem here is quite the opposite uh, uh, as, as, as the other. So she's trying to come up with better phenotypes for, for that. Um, and our other PhD student, Gaurav, He's establishing a heat stress evaluation for the U.S. hosting population. Uh, and hopefully we're going to try to do something with the GWAS here as well. And a master's student, Sagustin, he's implementing a genomic selection program in Argentina like this. We have two students that recently graduated. And what they did was very similar. They run a GWAS for different traits or different environments. And we observe different peaks. Um, why is that? That's what you're trying to understand. Why do we have different peaks when traits are highly correlated? So uh, uh, we go back to the multicollinearity thing. And our future student, uh, we're trying to study a little bit more of heat stress in the US dairy population. Uh, is heat stress the same across the country? So it's a huge country. Temperature varies a lot across the country. So is the same genetics in, 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 in different parts of the country the same? If you wanna help me answer that, we are searching 
for qualified PhD student to join us. So if you know somebody, if you're looking for a PhD program, come work with us. And with that, I would like to thank you all for listening to me and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you, Brenna. I think it was a great talk. Uh, do we have any, I, I'm looking at the chat is empty, but do we have any questions in the room? I have a question related to dog study. I wish to know which traits are you working on and on which dog breeds? So for the dog study, um, we actually have 23 traits right now. Okay. So that is a very cool thing that our collaborators from the IWDR, the International Working Dog Registry are doing. They have a, a behavior checklist okay. that they measure uh, um, pretty much everything that is important for guide dogs for the blind. Oh. So, and I, I cannot even name them all. I would have to read from a list, but but basically is how the animals respond to 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 their to their evaluation of stress. So, they, for example, they turn on a vacuum cleaner close to the animal and they see how the animal behaves with that sound. If the animal uh, um, how the animal respond to 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 it's mostly about uh, 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 responding to different stressors and they, they receive a score. What they are doing is that they are traveling across the world, training people on how to collect those phenotypes oh. on, on most Labradors, but we have some data on German Shepherds too. But for the study right now, we are focusing only on the Labradors because okay. we, yeah, we have about 5,000 phenotypes at this moment, about uh, uh, 40 behavior traits. We have about 20,000 uh, uh, total animals in the pedigree and other traits. And last time I checked, we had about 600 genotyped animals. Wow. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Uh, I, I have a question. Sure. Uh, nice presentation, uh, Bruno. I want to know how your student is measuring the heat stress in CAD, which method uh, so he or she is using. So for the heat stress in dairy, we are doing a random regression model uh, um, using the, the lactation, uh, uh, so the day of the lactation, like a test day model, as a function of a heat load function. That's basically how many uh, uh, THI degrees we are exceeding the threshold. Uh, in general, you, you're, you're keeping a threshold at 65. That was found by other researchers. We're not playing much with that. But we could, may, maybe, depending on the results, you're going to play a little bit with that. All right, teach, teach, I, yes, I'm fine. Yeah, so, so, yeah. and we're using the single step, so we don't have to, to, to work much with, uh, um, with more complicated phenotypes. Uh, um, All right. We also try to, to get, the difference between the expected lactation based on the lactation curve of the cows and the THI, but that became way too complicated for 11 million animals that we have. So okay. the test day model is, 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 is being the best approach for us at this moment. All right, thanks. No problem. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so you've mentioned, you know, the GWAS hits are all over the shelf, particularly when you're kind of changing the data slightly, right? Um, so, it, but then you also talked about the chromosome segments. It suggests that haplotypes, haplotype approaches should work. But whenever people have tried them, they didn't work. So mm -hmm. has anyone done any breakthroughs in that space? So the thing with haplotypes, uh, uh, so when we started doing that, and that was that was a very nice presentation this uh, um, this year in the animal science meeting. A student from Ignasi, she tried to do something similar to that as a haplotype approach. The problem is that haplotypes are physical, so they exist, and independent chromosome segments are theoretical. 
So it's the same thing as, uh, uh, so I like, I, I always like to explain to, to, to my students that is um, the, the, it's like limiting the, the, in the uh, um, effective population size, that is a theoretical value. So you have a, an effective population size of 140 animals. It doesn't mean that we can use 140 individuals in our analysis. Same thing with independent chromosome segments. If you have 427, that's what we found for the pigs. It doesn't mean that at 427 haplotypes will do the job because those, that is just a, 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 a statistical value. So the haplotypes from what I see, they, they don't help much uh, uh, on, on the SNPs. They would reduce a little bit the, the multicollinearity though. Uh, uh, but for the GWAS, I don't, when I tried, I didn't find a solution. And this, this recent study from, from Georgia had very similar results from what we had. Uh, um, so to be quite honest, I have no idea how to solve that. Uh, and I'm quite thankful because thanks to that, I still have a job, right? Okay, uh, thank you. Brian, you can unmute yourself. Hi, uh, Bruno. Uh, great talk. Um, really appreciate your thoughts on on this kind of this prediction problem. Um, we see a lot of the same things in uh, in plant uh, breeding as well, too. Um, and uh, what I'm would interest your thoughts on are is it is it about getting the causative variance right, or is it about is that we don't understand the complexity that the causative variants are interacting, um, and and we don't know how to to efficiently model that without a lot of information. So I think I think it's a little bit of both, but I think it's more of the second case. I think that uh, uh, so in simulation we find them. Why? Because we created them in a very simple way, mm -hmm. and then we try to use the same simple approach in real data that's very messy, very complicated, with several interactions that we don't fully understand, and and we just try to to we just try to assume that that the theory is the same in a very simple simulation that we created. And, and don't take me wrong, I really think simulations are, are, are important for us to understand things. But in, in, in real life, the problem is much more complex. So I think- do you have, I was gonna ask, do you have um, ideas on strategies for like rough approaches to find and describe the interactions like expression networks? Um, uh, and that would be an example. So I think I think gene expression is the way to go. The problem with gene expression, uh, uh, and and just think a little bit forward here is, we have so many different cell types, right? Each one is gonna is gonna show a different expression pattern, uh, and then we have almost an infinite number of environments. So when we average all the the expression patterns across tissues across environments. We have so many peaks that we go back to, to having lots of markers with a very small effect each. So uh, uh, it is great for understanding how things work, but for prediction, I'm still not sure how much they will help us because yeah. we go back to central limit theorem when we have uh, uh, so many tissues and so many environments. Uh, of course, I think we'll still be able to find a couple of things, but uh, uh, I think once we, 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 we include all of that knowledge together, I think we go back to, to, to a more polygenic model anyways. Yeah, interesting. Thanks. No problem. Uh, Bruno, we are off the time, so pe some people had to leave, but just maybe one final. I will leave my question when we meet on, on, on beer sometimes. But Perfect. we have one, one last question from Martin here. Martin says that increasing the sample size does seems to work in the human studies. Uh, for example, the latest and greatest GWAS on human height recently published. They don't explain as much of the variation, but they find the order of 10,000 GWAS hits. 
Is this just because they have less LD than farm animals or is something else going on? I think that's the case. I think in humans, the number of independent chromosome, chromosome segments are much more. So the, in, in, in that case, increasing data and increasing marker density, that helps a lot. But in our case, uh, uh, I think we have already enough data. We just need better theory on, on, on how to model those things. Or maybe we're doing the best uh, uh, given our limitations. Uh, um, but I don't, I don't like to think it this way. I think things can be improved. Uh, uh, but yeah, with our limited number of independent chromosome segments, I don't think uh, um, increasing density or data is improving. But in humans, yeah, because uh, uh, the, the effective population size and chromosome uh, uh, independent chromosome segments are much, much higher than, than what we have in animals. Okay, Brianna, thank you very much. We are over. Thank the you for time. having me. People will have to run, and I'm sure that uh, you can easily find Brianna on his university website and drop him an email uh, if you have more questions. And Brianna, thanks for agreeing with this. I know that you're a busy man. No problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great evening. <laughs>